Boardroom Bound, Episode 164, How Equity in the Boardroom Creates Thought Leadership for Organizations, with Jerusha Stewart. You're going to see more and more boards who are skilled in building inclusivity. It's not enough to get a diverse person on your board. You have to be able to leverage their skills and talents to create that competitive advantage for your company in the marketplace. And we are committed as an organization to assisting companies in building those inclusive boards of the future and in getting that information and that those educational tools out to the board marketplace where they, where they go to grow and learn. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. And quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And of course, this is February. This is Black History Month. And I am so excited today to welcome Jerusha Stewart of Take Your Seat onto the show. She has really helped turn that tragedy of George Floyd's passing into an opportunity to begin to change the boardroom for good. We're going to hear about how the organization started today. And it really changes the script when you think about it and the great work they're doing. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to share a message from our sponsor about director certification. Want to join your first board or are you looking for additional board seat opportunities? In either scenario, be sure to be disciplined in your approach. Now through the Becoming an Exceptional Board Director Candidate Coaching and Certification course, you get both modern board director candidate packaging and modern board operations knowledge integrated within one program. Remember the key to landing additional or your first board seat is in your packaging. Make the effort to do it right. Program graduates also receive their globally recognized International Board Director Competency designation upon course completion. It's designed for individuals and groups. You can learn more at bit.ly slash IBDC D. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash IBC D. And now let's jump into the show. Jerusha Stewart, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you, Alexander. So happy to be here. And of course, this is perfect timing. This is February. This is Black History Month. This is a great time. Would be any time would be a great time to have you on the show. But I'm really excited to talk about Take Your Seat today, the great work you guys, the important work you guys are doing. But I get ahead of myself. So before I jump there, let's start for a bit of a background into you so that people can understand what you were doing before you got to TYS. And then we'll talk about that story and go from there. Start with my background in Hawaii, which is where I grew up, which is a polycultural society. We have people from all over the world, and I think everyone's familiar with the aloha, the aloha spirit, which is really about creating a sense of belonging for everyone. So when I built Take Your Seat with our team, that's something that we're very much focused on, is creating this sense of belonging in the boardroom. And I originally came to the mainland to go to Stanford. So I'm a, I'm a double dipper. I went to Stanford undergrad as well as law school, did some coursework at Oxford as an undergrad. So I've had the privilege of having a wonderful education and being exposed to people from, again, all over the world and realizing that we pretty much all want the same thing, right, which is to be able to have the life that we want, the life of our dreams. So I've always been focused on this idea of equity. You know, how do you have equity with others? Equity and empathy. And so everything in my professional background has kind of been geared towards that, and I've had a very unconventional background Um, from starting out as a clothing designer, an award-winning clothing designer, and then kind of bridging into commercial real estate and the dot-com world, and then the entertainment world, starting one of the top film festivals in the world, the Vero Beach Wine and Film Festival, and then finally coming to lead Take Your Seat. So it's 
all been a road on this same journey. And I feel proud and privileged to be here. Well, I, I will tell you, whenever I hear Aloha, I tend to I watch ESPN a lot. I think of Chris Berman, and he uses it for home runs, and Aloha means goodbye as much as it means hello. But I love the way you framed it up for today, that it's created a sense of belonging in a boardroom. That's clearly going to be the motif that we'll talk about for Take Your Seat today. And I guess I want to use one quick takeaway from your introduction that when I sort of summarize it up, I'm going to say, you know, marketing and public relations skills expert. And I'm sure that has been incredibly important about Take Your Seat. So I'm sure we'll get to that. But how did Take Your Seat come about? Tell us what the organization does and how it started. Actually came about from in a in a way very much like the celebrations and recognition of Black History Month. My co-founders David Baldwin and John Rapogel were both very moved by the murder of George Floyd, and each of them agreed to step down off a board so that a black professional could join that board. So it's this idea of being an ally and giving space or making way for someone else to step up and have opportunity and to have privilege of being in service. And so that's why Take Your Seat, it's actually an action, right? A declaration of something that we can do to take action to equify life, to make the world a better place. Well, that is a powerful start because board seats are very hard to get, and you would find very few people that give them up. There are even certain industries and organizations where they continue to move the age of retirement further up uh, along the spectrum so that people don't have to give up their board seats. So I think those are some powerful people that are willing to be behind it and have their stories there. And that would say a lot to everybody listening if you're not familiar with some of the mechanics to be back in the boardroom. And, you know, Jerusha, maybe we should talk with some of the statistics just to set the scene. And, and, and we can use these powerfully, not just for, for black executives. We could talk about Latinos and, you know, you talk about like California and the laws that they put in place to get diversity on the boards. There's what, something like 40% Latino in California. It's like 0.4% Latino board member, something crazy like that. And it's not too far off when you think about black executives, right? So people of color in the country are what, about 40% of the minorities, but only about 10% of the board seats. Is it something like that? Exactly. And I have to say, we focus on black professionals because we believe we're the point of the spear, right? So that if we get numbers of black professionals in the boardroom, we're the actual dominoes to bring in diversity as a normative value into the boardroom. And that's why we chose that particular spot, you know, that particular campaign. And we should be very clear that when all of these great organizations, Latino corporate directors, Take Your Seat, others, they're all in some ways moving the, the, the ball forward on all of this perspective that diversity needs different people, different backgrounds, different experiences. You talked about being international before. That's another part of it. But I would say it's probably one visible example. When you look at the annual report photo, you can see, is that board pale, male, and stale? Or does it at least have some diversity that we can picture in different ways? And that's probably a very obvious, tangible difference that you're starting to see. Perhaps people going like, wow, we know we don't reflect our customers or our suppliers or our communities. Are you getting that sense from the organizations you're working with? Because you have some great names behind you. Well, we do, and we'd like to say this is such a huge movement and such a big mission that we're all locking arms to move forward, right? So women on boards, Latinos on boards, all the underrepresented groups, we're only doing the work so that we can all see the build those inclusive boardrooms of the future. So this isn't a competition per se, right? Right. <laughs> and when you, the, from the board's perspective, right, this idea of inclusivity is so important because boards that are diverse, that are diverse racially, it's a very specific kind of diversity, they actually perform 36% better on the company, right, when they have a racially diverse board. So there's a great incentive for companies to move that needle. And as well as you mentioned, you know, pictures tell a thousand words, tell a thousand stories. So this is the first time in history when the boards have been under so much scrutiny and so much public Mm -hmm. scrutiny. And millennials focus on what are you doing? Who's showing up? Who are you showing up for? 
And so it's been documented that 40% of their purchases are made based on these types of metrics, that they look for these things when they're making their purchases, whether it's consumer or investment. So that's why you're seeing what we call equity accelerators, so much movement to push these ideas forward in the marketplace and in the boardroom. Now, I think we should be really clear. I want to talk back before I, I sort of hinted at it. So I think like your marketing and public relations skills are very important here. The message that you give, if I were to come away with a tagline about Take Your Seat, TYS, I would probably phrase it as you're, you're asking senior board members to create, earmark, or resign a board seat to make room for qualified people of color. And I think that is a very different way than any of the other organizations that I've seen working on this same larger goal of bringing diversity to the boardroom. I've thought about it. And you gave a great example for some of the co-founders who gave up their hard seat. <laughs> and people who listen to this podcast are after one of those seats and they're hard to get specifically to give it to someone else to have that different view in the room. And I haven't heard other organizations say it that way. They've perhaps talked about let's put pressure on organizations so they know that their customers, their community, their suppliers, their employees want this. But to specifically go to the say the board individuals rather than the collective is an, an innovative way of going about it. Please tell us more about how that started and how you're seeing progress along that. The way it started actually is very interesting. So David Baldwin sat on the board of an organization called the One Club for Creativity, which is like the Oscars for marketing professionals. And he had sat on that board for a number of years. So the CEO came to him and asked him if he would step down off the board because he wanted to create more diversity on their board. And he said, David, you've been on the board such a long time that if you step down, you actually can nominate your successor. And he asked him to nominate a black woman. So it was a great partnership, and this is the way this should work, right, between the CEO and a board member to achieve a greater good. And we, they, we looked at that story and realized, you know, David then told – asked another friend of his to step down off the board. Then he met with John, and they realized that this was something, this was an unusual way, as you say, to create more room on a board. So I want to touch on something here because there's sort of this weird chicken egg dynamic that people would say, right? So you have to have the seats, but also the people to fill the role. And you gave a wonderful example there of, I would specifically like this role filled by, as in your story was, would it be a black woman? And that's a great thing to be able to say. Oftentimes there's the answer, or perhaps we would say the excuse of, but I haven't found the people that are qualified. You know, We've been running into this as well for say, getting women on the board in general. If I knew more qualified women, they would be around the table. We can look at what's going in the NFL right now and say that this doesn't make sense. Like this are people at the top who are making decisions are maybe not talking to the right people. Uh, as someone told me here locally, like I need to color my own index, my Rolodex in order to find the people that I need to know for different opportunities. So help us understand. I know you're working on both sides and not only the public awareness, but also the education and getting people prepared and ready or as well, maybe just connecting the dots between them. So tell us about both sides of the equation. So we look at this as diversity is about the number, right? It's about counting who's in the boardroom. Inclusivity is about making them count. So on the diversity side, that's why we built an online community to connect the black professional with the white board leader or CEO, the person who could make room, right, in the room, and who didn't have that person in their network who, you know, the person who was raising their hand to say, yes, I'd like to do something about who's sitting at the table. I just don't know who, I don't know how, right? So that was, the, that's kind of like the first step. And it's, and, and really it's reciprocal, right? Because we're expanding the network of the black candidate and at the same time expanding the network of the board leader or CEO. On the education side, we are demystifying the board search process for the candidate. So a lot of people, two, two years ago, no one knew how you got into a boardroom. You know, it was sort of like, 
you got into the room and you closed the door behind you. No one knew what was going, how you got there. It, it was just this sort of black box, as it were, right? So part of what we wanted to bring to the space was to open it up and to give the candidates the information they need. They need to make the decision, but not just the decision around what's in the room, but how you get into the room and what it looks like. So in the past, it was an, a whisper campaign, right? So how you got onto a board is, you know, Joe, I would lean into a friend. Hey, do you know anybody? Uh, yes, I know this guy or this friend of mine has a son, that kind of thing. We are one of the rare places online that post board opportunities. So candidates can see what the requirements are and what's the frame for that type of service. So it's not hidden in that sense. For the board leader, they're afraid of making a misstep. What happens when we engage with this black professional? What happens when we invite them onto our board? What do we say? How do we onboard them? How is this different? How do we how are we all comfortable and creating consensus in the room, which is why we pioneered a program called the Inclusive Leadership Series, which is based on Deloitte's six traits of inclusive leadership to help train the board leaders on how to create consensus with a diverse board. So you're right. It's marketing and education, but for both size of that door into that room. Now, I, I know another part of it is probably, I'm going to say almost being that handshake person in between because you have your own massive, let's say, index of all of these great people who'd fit for different opportunities and you're getting more organizations are going. They're probably calling you up and say, Drusha, we have decided we want to earmark a seat for a person of color. Please help us maybe find that because we're not finding it in our networks now. And I know that you've been assisting some boards in seating a black director. So maybe you can talk about the or what you're doing as an organization and how that's helping. Yes, we have been, and it's been just so fulfilling. It's amazing because the, the process starts, I like to think of it starting with the candidate and hearing their story and hearing why they're interested in board service, right? And what's drawing them to a certain type of board or a certain company. And then we're also having that conversation where a company is coming to us. And often it might be a private equity firm that has a company within their portfolio that's looking to seat a new director. Um, and, and typically it could be their first independent director, right, which is a whole nother set of parameters. We are also just recently started working with the NASDAQ. We became a partner of the NASDAQ. So we also look for candidates for pre-IPO and IPO companies. And we don't do a lot of public companies. We've worked with Unilever. Um, we typically, our sweet spot is mid-cap, $100 million to $500 million when it comes to looking and working with companies that are searching for this type of talent. Um, one of our major partners is B-Lab, which certifies B Corps. And one of the reasons we were so excited to partner with them is they're like that warm landing for a candidate because they already have, as part of their ethos, a concern for people, planet, and profit, right? They already have, as part of their certification, a lean into anti-racism. So we're not, we say we're about the conversation and not conversion when it comes to working with companies. Well, I love hearing about the success that you're doing, clearly building great momentum behind it. And I'd love to explore with you what happens after one of these successful placements. And I'll give an example of uh, someone who's a friend of mine, Cheryl Batchelder, who's on several leading boards. She has shared the story on the podcast and the show about when she became the first female to join one of these public company boards. And she said, you could see the conversation change. And they realized, okay, maybe we, we shouldn't have martinis at lunch during the meeting. And, and they stopped talking about certain things and they shifted. I imagine there are going to be some major changes as well when you 
get a first person of color inside some of these boardrooms. And maybe that's to be expected. But perhaps there's also a part of preparing the people stepping into it of you are you are breaking some some norms, you're setting some new standards and some goals. Not that that's someone's job to do. They're just there to be a great board member. But I guess we need to be conscious of that. Do you have any insights into this? Well, it's so amazing we're having this conversation today, Alexander, and celebrating Black History Month. At Take You See, we say we are history in the making. And every time a black director steps into that room for the first time, they're making history. Mm. That board is making history, right? And I think it's a share it's that shared collaborative experience that we want to focus on from both the candidate perspective and the board perspective because such greatness comes out of it for both parties. So for example, right, the board learns how to be comfortable with something or someone who they may have seen as different before. And that was the whole point of bringing in a different perspective in the first place is to gain that new knowledge, right? On the candidate side, it's like stepping into a whole new level of performance and career and service that they're going to be gaining just an enlarged skill set around, right? And network. On the board side, it gives them the opportunity to try out a lot of things they might not have done before, but benefit the entire board. So for instance, onboarding. Most boards don't have a formal onboarding process. So whether you're black, white, purple, or pink, when you show up, you, you just go to that first meeting a lot of times, and you're not really, like, let's say kind of staged into that working relationship with your fellow directors. You're going to hit the ground running, and yet you really don't know what you're going to hit the ground running with or about. So one of the things that's happened with this movement to create diversity in the boardroom is a lot more attention is being paid to the onboarding process. So let's not just give them, you know, the board book, the 300 pages, And let's not just have them meet the chair of the board. Let's make sure that they meet, you know, the other board members and they have a sense of the personalities and they have a sense of what's important to this particular board at this particular time so they know what we're focused on. So there's a lot more attention being given to that process, right? Another thing that's happening are board audits. So in the past, Boards haven't really um, given themselves grades or actually looked at the performance of the individual board members. And that's actually part of their duty and a right that they have as an organization to keep themselves um, functioning well. So one of the things that has happened is for boards that want to bring in new members and fresh ideas, They have looked at, you know, having themselves evaluated. You know, is this board member still bringing value after 10 years? Is this a particular skill set that we still need on this board? And that's been a way that they can make room for additional thought leadership. Another idea that's kind of taken hold is more boards are adding seats. So boards actually can increase their size, right? And now boards are actually taking a look at that more seriously in terms of bringing additional talent and skills onto their boards so that they can cope with the larger scope of issues from today's world that they may not, you know, they didn't have a pandemic to think about two years ago. Cybersecurity wasn't a huge issue in the past that they were focused on, supply chain. So all these things that are popping up. And then, again, marketing and social media because there's so much more public scrutiny 
of the board and of the company itself and how it's showing up in the world. So all of this has allowed boards to start to evolve in ways that they may not have even considered in the past and put them on the path of being more productive. Well, I will echo and support your views on onboarding and board evaluations. I've been shocked for these incredibly important parts of an organization, perhaps you'd argue the most important, that we don't do them very well. So kudos there for making it work. I would love if we'd just sort of think ahead for a minute to some successes. So you've, you've talked about maybe some of the organizations where you've seen that first person of color come on board. Very exciting and wonderful. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on where maybe there's a tipping point, if I use that term, for where a board begins to change, not just from having the one person and not just, I don't want to say it's a token, right, but having more of those thoughts and more perspectives around the table. So Cheryl Batchelor gave the example of when there was a difference when she was the first female on the board to when they got a second and actually a third. She said that was when things started to change and really things took hold and took off in different ways. Do you see there's some sort of perspective? And I realize if you're talking about a pre-IPO, it's a much smaller board than, say, versus a public company, maybe that has 12, for example. What are your thoughts on, on how we get, say, the right number and types of people in the room? For for women, we could say, well, it should be 50-50. We can easily picture what that looks like. But when we talk about different backgrounds and experiences that people need to have, what is the right perspective and number that we should be getting around the table? Well, I'll say two things, right, Alexander? Um, the power of three, the research on the power of three is very well documented. And it's such a critical idea for boards to grab hold of because typically they are, you know, your typical size, five to seven, seven to ten. So we may not, in most cases, be talking about huge organizations, right? Everyone is aware that putting one person on that board who is different, and let's say different not just because of the color of their skin, but different from their relationships, someone who's going to be perceived as the other or the outsider makes it that much harder for that person to bring their whole self to the boardroom and to to be effective. And yes, I would agree, every, every time you bring in the next person who is different and diverse, you increase the value of the other members of that board. So that's well known, right? I think that what we're really talking about is that for each organization, this is, this is going to look different in terms of what is their quote-unquote diversity profile. We just saw Spanx lead, you know, this big funding round, and it was an all-female team. And that's like the first time that's happened in the investment world. Now I bet they're going to go for that all-female board. Hmm. Now, what is that? Is, is that still diversity, right? You can you could argue, given potentially given their product mix, if that board is females from all different backgrounds and all different ethnicities and racial makeups, that it's going to be a powerful player in the corporate world. And I think each company has to look at what they want to achieve and what their objectives are and determine how does diversity play there. You know, how does your DEI meet your ROI? Right. I, I like the way you... I like the way you said that there. And, and let me use that as we try to wrap up this episode now and finish it off, because uh, we're going to talk about goals and objectives for the future. And we talked about the tragedy from which TYS emerged and the idea that we should not let another one of these senseless problems go go to waste. And George Floyd's killing was just awful. And yet we're seeing some amazing things with TYS as one example coming from that. So we're talking about a year and a half old, something like that. I'm sure you've got big plans and visions. You're talking about how some of the success now is, say, some of the mid-cap companies. I'm sure there's a vision to see that grow and develop. Drusha, what, what should we expect to see as we watch TYS grow and develop over the next few years? So I think as 
actually see Take Your Seat grow and develop over the next few years, you're going to see more and more boards who are skilled in building inclusivity. It's not enough to get a diverse person on your board. You have to be able to leverage their skills and talents to create that competitive advantage for your company in the marketplace. And we are committed as an organization to assisting companies in building those inclusive boards of the future and in getting that information and that those educational tools out to the board marketplace where they, where they go to grow and learn. Because what we've seen is there are plenty of diversity tools and resources and workshops for the workforce that needs to be in place at the board level because it's at the board level where they make the decisions that influence all of our lives across the entire landscape of health care and education and wealth generation. So it's in the boardroom that we need to have the diversity of voices and perspectives that are leveraged to the highest degree possible. And that's where Take Your Seat is going with our message and our mission and our efforts. Well, Jerusha, I love the mission that you're on, and we were delighted to have you on the show today. Thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom bound. Thank you, Alexander. It was wonderful speaking with you today. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound, and I am thrilled as part of Black History Month that we got to speak with Jerusha Stewart today and learn all about Take Your Seat and the important work that they are doing to diversify the boardroom. And we've talked about it from different perspectives on this show, about more females in, more uh, Latinos. Uh, black executives should not be thought of either. The people of color of all sorts of different backgrounds are so important in the boardroom, and I'm thrilled about, you heard about the unique ways that they are approaching, including getting people to resign their board seats to make space for a person of color. And fantastic results. Remember, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you'll find links to all of today's resources. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to Boardroom Bound.